Uh, Mr. Treasurer, yes. uh, Miss Maxwell Scott, your graces, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I pray silence for your president, Professor Trevor Roper, Regis Professor of Modern History in the University of Oxford, to propose the toast of the evening, the memory of Sir Walter Scott. Professor Trevor Roper. Bicentenaries are a terrible burden, a double burden, a burden for both victims, uh, he whose bicentenary is celebrated and he who has to celebrate it. <laughs> Sir Walter Scott suffers, I think, from th this bicentenary. Will he ever revive? After being thus forcibly and artificially jerked into life again, will he be buried deeper than ever? Will this be the last Walter Scott dinner? I hope not. And what of me? Admittedly, there is a certain glory in it. We centenarists are not to be confused with vulgar anniversarists. <laughs> <laughs> they occur every year. We are the fine flower, the centenarian aloe, which flowers only once in a hundred years. And naturally, we can afford to look downwards, somewhat indulgently, upon those barren, tough leaves <coughs> which year after year repeat themselves without ever coming uh, to flower. But however we may exult in this <coughs> temporary efflorescence, there is also the serious side of the business. At a bicentenary, <coughs> one must say something serious. One must ask large questions, portentous questions, to which the answers must equally be large, grave, and portentous. The sort of questions which can't be asked and answered <coughs> easily, lightly, year after year, but uh, since I don't expect to see another bicentenary, must be answered now or never. <laughs> and of course, in doing so, we would hardly, uh, uh, we would hardly uh, fail to show how original we were and had thought of things which nobody else had thought of. This, therefore, is a rather difficult uh, subject, because Scott has been celebrated for uh, 200 years and a great deal has been said, and some very good things have been said. Indeed, I think sometimes that Scott has inspired, just as he has also perpetrated, some extremely good and some extremely bad writing. And one thing I would like to see in a bicentenary year is a republication of some of the really good essays which have been written about Scott, some of those marvelous essays which have been written about Scott among a great deal of trash, uh, beginning with that wonderful essay by Carlyle and ending perhaps uh, with that, I think, marvelous uh, uh, double lecture by Janet Adam Smith uh, eight years ago in the uh, Edinburgh University uh, Walter Scott Lectures. Now, when I ask what I should say in proposing the memory of Walter Scott after 200 years, the question which occurs to me is this. The, the bicentenarian question. Why was Scott born in 1771, not in 1671 or 1871? Why was it precisely at that time that this unpromising northern peninsula produced its <laughs> only original imaginative uh, uh, genius in the world of letters. I think there's a reason. It was remarked by Voltaire that if Oliver Cromwell had been born in the 18th century, he would have been a mere London merchant. And Lord Keynes said of Shakespeare that England had him when she could afford him. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think there is uh, truth in these remarks of a kind. Every great man, however he may transcend the context uh, in which he is born, also belongs to that context and is made by that context. And Scott, like everyone else, is a man of his generation, even if also he transcends his generation and uh, lives still with us. He's a man of his generation in the sense that I believe it would have been impossible for Scott to have been born in Scotland, uh, for Scotland to have produced such a man at any other time in its history. And that for uh, perfectly determinable reasons. Consider the Scotland which produced Scott. After the Union of 1707, Scotland, which till then had been a backward, inward-looking, cramped, almost fossilized society, broke out under the stimulus of new wealth and new opportunities and, one must add, new accidents. It took some time, it wasn't really till after 1745 that uh, the full advantages were realized. But from, but the generation before Scott, the generation, let us say, 1745 to 1770, was a marvelous generation in which Scotsmen determined quite seriously to make what is now called a great leap forward, to drag this backward country upwards and achieve in one generation all that concentrated into one generation all the progress which had been achieved by more fortunate countries over uh, 200, 250 years. This was a very serious task. It required serious application. It was not to be carried out uh, in a frivolous, gay, humorous, romantic spirit. It was carried out by hard work and uh, study of economics uh, study of uh, sociology. And it was done. In that generation, that extraordinary generation which f filled the, uh, the generation before the birth of Scott, this enormous achievement was done so that this country, which had been so backward and indeed in the uh, opinion of Scots themselves so barbarous, uh, half a century before, became uh, one of the great societies of Europe. So that Je Thomas Jefferson, for instance, could say that the universities of Geneva and uh, Edinburgh were the two eyes of Europe. This effort was made in Scotland in the generation before Scott. At that time, Serious-minded Scotsmen were, if anything, rather ashamed of being Scotland, being Scotch, because they felt that this was a backward country which had to be carried forward. That is the time when they took lessons in uh, de-Scotticizing themselves, when they carefully pruned the Scotticisms out of their, uh, their writing, when they took elocution lessons to prune the Scotticisms out of their speech, when they dropped the name of Scotland and uh, called their country North Britain. But Scott did not belong to that generation. Scott had the good fortune to be born at the close of that generation. Scott came into a world in which the progress had been made and in which one no longer needed to be uh, or to feel ashamed uh, of the uh, society into which he was born. In other words, he could look with more indulgent eyes on those quaint survivals of a society which uh, was changing, had changed, could enjoy, admire, relish those relics of uh, what his uh, father's generation would have called barbarism, which still survived uh, 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 in Scotland. Scott himself is, of course, as 
uh, Professor Swan said, a very ambivalent figure, an ambiguous character. He has a foot in both camps. He is, at bottom, basically an Augustan, a man of the 18th century, a rationalist. He is not a romantic at all, at bottom. This is very clear when one looks into his early years. What in literature are the writers uh, whom Scott admired? Not Ossian, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, pseudo-prophet of proto-romanticism in Scotland. Not Gray, not Thompson, not even Shakespeare, whom he knew so well. Scott once said that the, only, that the poetry which gave him the greatest satisfaction of all was the poetry of, you may know, you probably do know, but I don't think one would guess that least romantic of poets, that least, uh, that uh, least friendly critic of Scotland, Dr. Johnson. It was Dr. Johnson's poetry, London and the Vanity of Human Wishes, which he thought took the palm for English literature. And what were the works of literature which Scott, to which Scott devoted his enormous industry, his unbelievable industry, uh, as uh, an editor? Slapdash and yet enormously uh, energetic. They were the great Augustans, Dryden, and Swift, whose whole works he published. And I may say, he edited the, work of the works of Dryden so well, in a casually in the course of a year, it, while doing other things, that those volumes of Dryden, 20 volumes of them, were thought worth republishing in toto a hundred years later. It, now it takes an entire American university uh, with a, a complete with a computer and a, a highly subsidized project uh, in order to begin the uh, attempt to eclipse this old casual throwaway uh, edition of, uh, uh, of Scott. Scott was basically an Augustan. He was also basically a rationalist. He was not, I'm afraid, a very religious man. In fact, uh, he, uh, as uh, Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, remarked, he seldom or never went into a church. And indeed, he once said that the only pleasure of going into a Presbyterian church was the anticipated pleasure of coming out of it again. <laughs> <laughs> he preferred the Anglican church uh, because, precisely because it was more uh, secular, less theocratic, uh, more worldly, uh, more conformist, and as he said, he, uh, basically, he agreed with uh, King Charles II that Presbyterianism was not a religion for gentlemen. <laughs> he was the least superstitious of men. I know I've seen it quite recently, attempts to suggest that Scott was one of these romantic people who believed in ghosts and fairies and everything like that. Not at all. You only have to read. He wrote a book on demonology. He wrote it, as he said, because he needed money. He'd write anything when he needed money. He made it absolutely <laughs> clear that he didn't believe one single word of it. And never in Scott's writing will one discover any concessions to superstition. Some of our neighbors today are much more superstitious in the full light and freedom of the 20th century than Scott was. When Scott bought the lock of curled shields in the borders, uh, he remarked that uh, uh, there was a, an ancient tradition that in this lock, as in many other locks in Scotland, there was a monster. This, of course, is a well-known pr belief among primitive peoples. <laughs> uh, uh, but Scott after telling a story of a, uh, an old lad who tried to set a trap for the monster, added that it's a bit late in the day to believe in lock monsters now. <laughs> <laughs> then again, I've even heard it suggested that Scott was a, Sc a Scotch nationalist. Unbelievable. Scott hated Scotch nationalism. Not that there was much of it at the time, but there was a little. There was that uh, neighbor of his who bought Dryborough, Lord Buchan, the Prince of Boars, as Scott called him. Lord Buchan, who got Scott buried in Dryborough. 
uh, Lord Button uh, worshipped his ancestors, of, uh, uh, and he claimed many more ancestors than he had, and he built grotesque statues of most of them. Uh, he uh, uh, acquired the burial place in Dryber Abbey uh, for Scott in uh, Scott's right as uh, being descended from the Halliburtons. And indeed, uh, he rubbed the thing in a bit, because when Scott was very ill in 1819, old Lord Buchan, who was then about 80, uh, forced his way into his bedroom in order to tell him what arrangements he'd made for his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Scott, out, Scott outlived him, and there, uh, 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 there are some very uh, enjoyable episodes about Lord Buchan. However, I, go, I ha happen to introduce Lord Buchan at this moment, because I will say something about him at the end. Lord Buchan, when he was a young man in 1789, he, he was a Scotch nationalist. He believed in an independent Scotch Republic. Went to Paris in order to uh, show his sympathy with the revolutionary French. This was not what Scott liked at all. He had no sympathy with revolution or with the French. <laughs> no, non no nonsense about the old alliance for Scott. As for a Scotch Republic, the thing was unheard of. Scott believed intensely in the Union. He wrote in praise of Maria Edgeworth, whose Irish novels were, he said, the uh, inspiration of his own, that she had done more by her novels to cement the Union, that is to say the Union of Ireland with England, than any amount of legislation. And he made it perfectly clear that his Waverley novels were meant to cement the Union, the uh, Anglo-Scottish Union, in the same way. Indeed, any suggestion that the Union should be tampered with roused him to horror. He once said that it would be infinitely better for Scotland rather than tamper with the, any detail of the structure of the Union that it should sink into being an inferior sort of Northumberland. <laughs> as long as it was annexed to England. Well, uh, <laughs> As a Northumbrian, I regard that as a high compliment. <laughs> I think that any country in the world should be pleased to be uh, regarded as an inferior sort of Northumberland. <laughs> this, then, is, I believe, the basic, the fundamental Scott. He is a, ma a man of the age of reason. He worked for money. <coughs> he ha had no romantic notions on that side, at any rate. But then there came the second development in Scott. The man whose, as it were, whose right foot was so firmly placed in the English 18th century enlightenment had his left foot <coughs> ventured with his left foot into the Scottish world which the men of the generation before him had so despised and which he did not despise because he didn't need to despise, no longer need one despise Scotland as backward. It was no longer backward. Now one could look at it openly, objectively, indulgently, tolerantly, and in the end, romantically and with admiration. In his early years, Scott discovered Scotland. On top of his English anglicized 18th century education, on top of his German Romanticism uh, acquired uh, while he was at the University in Edinburgh, he discovered the, the Scotland which was disappearing. Remember how quickly it had disappeared. Between 1745 and 1770 it had gone like that. The old Scottish structure of society, which had been so artificially preserved, cramped between England on the one hand and the Highland society on the other, had suddenly broken out, had been in transformed by the new wealth which had been infused into it. Old, frosty peel towers had suddenly had new furniture put in them, trees had been planted, all kinds of unknown vegetables had cropped up out of the, this barren soil. Already in 1773, two years after the birth of Scott, Johnson and Boswell went on their famous tour uh, of the Highlands and Hebrides. And yet, J Johnson said afterwards, we came too late. Already, this distinct Highland society, which they had come to see, had disappeared. 
had dissolved. It had gone as quickly as that after 1745. And because it had gone, because Jacobitism was no longer a rural thing and couldn't really upset, uh, give nightmares to anyone, a loyal Hanoverian like Scott could uh, uh, enjoy the luxury of this make-believe Jacobitism uh, in which he indulged, could portray the society, the Highland society, and indeed the Lowland society uh, of Scotland uh, in uh, this new indulgent way. No longer did one have to despise the, uh, the, uh, the, the dead skin which one was throwing aside in the furious forward march of progress. One could stop, look at it objectively, see that society has many values, that society is a various and multiple organism, and one can admire it all and enjoy it all, and do justice to it all. Nothing, I think, is so gives uh, such excitement reading the life of Scott, reading the letters and diaries and autobiographical scraps uh, out of which his life is composed as the account of his exploration of Scotland. I sometimes think that Scott's discovery of Scotland is an experience as uh, exciting as the Elizabethan discovery of England uh, uh, two centuries before. First, we have Scott at Sandy now in the borders in his childhood uh, where he says his interest was first captivated by uh, the, uh, the relics of ancient society around him, the border life, the introverted border life now changed, now puffed out with wealth from India and other sources, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless surviving. And then he extended that into the border valleys in those famous uh, raids of the Liddesdale, which he carried out every year collecting ballads. Those ballads of which Carlyle wrote afterward, which he published as the minstrelsy of the Scottish border, and which, as Carlyle wrote afterwards, proved to be a well from which flowed one of the broadest of rivers. Metrical romances, which in due time pass into prose romances, the old life of men resuscitated for us, it is a mighty word. Not as dead tradition, but as palpable presence the past stood before us. Then also he went further into the highlands and discovered the, the ancient relics of Jacobite Celtic Highland society. Found old mortality, uh, Peter uh, Patterson, uh, whatever his name was, uh, uh, cleaning the tombstones in Dunlotter graveyard, visited old uh, Jacobite lairds, uh, the marvelous account of how he arrived uh, at uh, some old tower and there saw the lad and his sons and uh, three or four gillies lying half asleep in their tartans on the hill with, gay, with dogs and guns around them and down below in the courtyard the lady and the daughters uh, were carting dung uh, and uh, 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 busy about uh, a different kind of uh, uh, rural operation. <laughs> And uh, this spectacle when he dined in the evening of the giant haggis carried in on a, in a wicker basket by groaning half-naked Celts with a pipe uh, uh, blasting uh, uh, dissonance uh, before it. And this evaporating world is what he recreated, of course, totally anachronistically at Abbotsford, here in the borders, uh, in on the Tweed, within sight of civilization, if I may say so. <laughs> <laughs> within sight of Northumberland, anyway. <laughs> there on the Tweed, uh, in his last years, when uh, romanticism had really gone to his head, uh, there he would drink whiskey out of a quake and, uh, and uh, have uh, uh, pipes uh, 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 at his meals and uh, wear tartans and uh, all the Highland paraphernalia was suddenly brought into the borders. Well, I'm uh, glad to see it. Uh, it still seems to have stayed in some respects. <laughs> And, of course, after the Highlands, then came the further explorations of those voyages to the islands, uh, 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 to the Hebrides, and in 1814, the, uh, uh, the, island, the lighthouse voyage. 1814, the year when everything comes to fruition. Uh, 
1814, a double anniversary. Much more important historically than 1771 or 1971. 1814, the end in effect of Napoleon. 1814, the beginning of the Waverley novels. And of course the two things are connected. This love this conservative, one must admit, this conservative love of an ancient society happens to coincide with a moment in the history of Europe when conservatism triumphs over the 18th century. When men have come to say that it is all very well, these 18th century ideas of progress sounded very well in the 18th century, but where have they led us? They have led us to the ruthless conquest of Europe by Napoleon. And now that the nations of Europe have risen up, and now that the ancient institutions of Europe have ultimately defeated Napoleon, well, there must be something in ancient irrational institutions after all. So we have a complete new phase of the intellectual history of Europe, a phase with which the Waver which, in which the Waverley novels find their place. Hence their marvelous success uh, abroad. Those marvellous novels written from 1814 to 1820, much the best of all. After that, he found it came so easy, and there were all those woods to plant, and he wanted to buy Fortinside and Darnick Tower, and, uh, of course, he, uh, he uh, uh, wrote for the market. And I'm afraid the books after 1820, in my opinion, are not so good. But still, those marvellous years, 1820, they coincide with the new mood of Europe. But they don't only do that, because in, insensibly, as he combined his Augustan beginnings with his new romanticism arising and relativism rising from the discovery of Scotland, Scott evolved a new historical philosophy and indeed a new political philosophy. And these affected the whole 19th century. The new historical philosophy is, I believe, can be summarized as the belief in the, va the equal value of every age. In the 18th century, men had said, Scotsmen particularly had said, the 17th century is too awful for words. It looks backward. We've got out of that. Thank God. Let's forget about it. It's not progressive. The 18th century is progressive and we can be proud of it. But Scott said, no, every age is autonomous. The 17th century may, may not have been progressive, but the people of the 17th century had they, their way of life. Let us respect it. Let us respect everyone's different way of life. Let us not assume that only that matters in history that looks towards us. This is a vain and arrogant historical attitude. And this is, I believe, the new historical philosophy which Scott, I don't say he created it, but he helped to create and which inspired the great historians of the 19th century and transformed the study of history. Of course, it all went bad. Everything goes bad in the end. The, uh, the most perfect, the most delicious fruit all go bad if you, uh, uh, ultimately, but you judge them at the time of their, uh, uh, when they are ripe. Uh, we, we don't judge people by consequences. As for the political philosophy, Scott's political philosophy, as it seems to me, evolved out of those same circumstances. That is to say, he saw Scotland divided in the past, divided by feuds, divided Highlander against Lowlander, and by applying this philosophy, he said, in effect, each has its own value. Let us create and I think gradually he saw this positive vision before him of creating a real union of Scotsmen, of creating a real union between Highlanders and Lowlanders, between all kinds of Scotsmen, between the past and the present. He didn't look at the future. He wasn't interested in the future. And this he did. And one can, of course, laugh at it. Even poor old Lockhart was a bit shaken, you know. He tried to conceal the fact, but he was a bit shaken that uh, some of Scott's uh, romantic conservatism and that famous episode in 1822 when King George IV came to, uh, uh, to, to Edinburgh, that really was too much even for him. When uh, George IV was so, himself was so carried away, Lockhart said the, the, the kilts and tartans were a little too much in evidence. 
And when George IV himself proposed the toast of the chieftains and, highland, uh, uh, chieftains and clans of Scotland, as if Scotland consisted entirely of these uh, uh, chieftains and clans, that, that really uh, uh, shook even Lockhart. And, of course, this romantic Jacobitism, which meant nothing, because he wasn't a Jacobite at all. Uh, it was safe to be a Jacobite. It was a luxury. Uh, it was part of that quality of make-believe which is so attractive in a novelist. And that absurd conservatism. Uh, poor old uh, Hogg, uh, et uh, et the Ettrick Shepherd, with his solid peasant independence, he was horrified at Scott's romantic snobbism, his, his uh, affectation of vassalage to Scott of Harden and the Duke of Buccleuch. And uh, 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 Scott, he also, of course, slightly resented the way Scott kept Hogg silent in good company as not being producible in, in, good, in good company. Uh, this, then, is the philosophy. This is the political ideal of Scott. It has nothing to do with Scottish nationalism. It is creating a new identity in a country which hadn't got an identity before and producing it out of its historic elements. I say one can be, uh, 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 one can be amused at it. Uh, one man who understood Scott extremely well and was very unsympathetic to him uh, and yet was deeply influenced by him was Lord Macaulay. And Macaulay is, can be extremely good uh, 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 precisely because, like Scott, he was also ambiguous and could look at the, uh, the uh, same phenomenon from two sides. I want to indulge myself by reading a little uh, passage of Macaulay in which he describes, in effect, the uh, achievement of Scott from two different angles. He describes the... <coughs> Uh, what I call the tartanism, the uh, representing all Scotland uh, as if it were the Highlands. Everything Scotch now has to be wrapped in tartan paper, you know. <laughs> <coughs> Whatever was repulsive was softened down. Whatever was graceful and noble was brought prominently forward. Some of these works were ex executed with such admirable art that like the historical plays of Shakespeare, they, they superseded history. We all recognize who this is. The visions of the poet were realities to his readers. The places which he described became holy ground and were visited by thousands of pilgrims, etc. Few people seem to be aware that at no remote period a MacDonald or a MacGregor in his tartan was to a citizen of Edinburgh or Glasgow what an Indian hunter in his war paint is to an inhabitant of Philadelphia or Boston. <laughs> Artists and actors presented Bruce and Douglas in striped <laughs> petticoats. They might as well have represented Washington brandishing a tomahawk and girt with a string of scalps. <laughs> At length, this fashion reached a point beyond which it was not easy to proceed. The last British king who held a court in Holyrood thought that he could not give a more striking proof of his respect for the usages which had uh, prevailed in Scotland before the Union than by disguising him in what before the Union was considered by nine Scotchmen out of ten as the dress of a thief. <laughs> that is uh, putting it perhaps a little crudely. But here is the same uh, phenomenon seen from the other side. Talking about the difference between Scotland and Ireland, how a real unity of uh, the Scottish people was achieved, whereas a real unity of the Irish people has not to this day been achieved, uh, he, uh, uh, he gives this account. <coughs> it would be difficult to name any eminent man in whom national feeling and clannish feeling were stronger than in Sir Walter Scott. Yet when Sir Walter Scott mentioned Killy Cranky, he seemed utterly to forget that he was a Saxon, that he was of the same blood and of the same speech with Ramsay's foot and Annandale's horse. His heart swelled with triumph when he related how his own kindred had fled like hares before a smaller number of warriors of a different breed and a different tongue. <laughs> but this uh, is said in praise, that after all, it was a great achievement to have created a Scottish unity uh, out of such disparateness, whereas an Irish unity has never been created. That, I think, must be taken as a, uh, the real political achievement of Scott. That, then, 
to me, is Scott in his historical perspective. But on a bicentenary, one must say, what does it mean now? The answer is, of course, nothing at all. We read Scott today because of his art. We understand him better, I believe, if we see him in his social context, the context of his time, the intellectual context of his time. But we read him as we read Cervantes, as we read Gogol, because he is a great novelist. And I believe he should be read. I believe he's a wonderful novelist, especially if one does understand uh, the, the uh, background against which he is writing. It is not a background for us. It has no meaning for us at all. It is purely historical. Nevertheless, as I happen to live in the Scott country, I sometimes wonder what he would think of some of the events going on around us. And since perhaps one ought to end by inspiring you, I hope, to some positive action, I will mention two uh, little details of uh, Scott's local life, uh, which may be appropriate. In 1828, there was an attempt to desecrate the border country by driving a road through the village of Darnick. <laughs> Scott was in London at the time. He recorded the, uh, his actions uh, in his diary. 24th of April, 1828, spent the day in rectifying a road bill which drew a turnpike road through all the Darnickers' cottages and a good field of my own. I got it put to rights. <laughs> that was the end of the Darnick scheme of 1828. Well, you may say Scott is a conservative, a pure conservationist. Uh, we live in an age of progress when things should be done, action should be taken, uh, violent action if necessary in the name of progress. Don't think that Scott hadn't got his progressive side. I mentioned Lord Buchan. Uh, I'm going to come back to him. I also uh, should mention that Scott, one reason why Scott was suspicious of religion was that he regarded, the clergy will be surprised to hear this, that he regarded it as a means of uprooting society, of destroying the foundations of society. He genuinely, at the end of his life, he lived in fear of revolution. And in 1832, when the reform bill was passed, uh, it finished him off. He decided that this was the end after this. The horrors of democracy were bound to come upon us, uh, and there was no hope. However, he saw one little shred of silver lining in the sky. And here it is. I'm reading this from uh, Hogg the Ettrick Shepherd's Domestic Manners of Sir Walter Scott. Uh, and he is referring to the Earl of Buchan's ornamental improvements at Dryborough, which contained, among other things, the colossal statue of Wallace, which stands, I think, in the grounds of Beamerside, which I rather liked and admired, said, uh, uh, says Hogg, whose taste was not very elevated, I think, but which Sir Walter perfectly abhorred. And he used these very words. If I live to see the day when the men of Scotland, like the children of Israel, Shall every one do that which is right in his own eyes, which I am certain either I or my immediate successors will see? I have settled in my own mind long ago what I shall do first. I'll go down and blow up the statue of Wallace with gunpowder. <laughs> yes, I shall blow it up in such a style that there will be not one fragment of it left, the horrible monster. <laughs> Therefore, if I am to end on a constructive, positive, uh, active <laughs> note, I can adv advise uh, one of three courses. I either you would have the approval of Scott if you carried out any of these courses. One, uh, put an end to the Darnick project. <laughs> Two, <laughs> blow up the statue of Wallace. Three, what I hope you will do anyway, because I really think they are among the great neglected works of literature, read those marvelous novels written mainly between 1820, 1814 and 1820. 
Waverley, Old Mortality, Guy Mannering, Heart of Midlothian, Rob Roy, uh, The Antiquary. And remembering that roll call of marvellous uh, works, I ask you to rise and drink the toast to the memory of Sir Walter Scott. The toast is the memory of Sir Walter Scott.